We're going to be in the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah. So turn your Bibles to Zephaniah. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a black one around you. It's going to be uh, on page uh, 790, 790, uh, the book of Zephaniah. If you have a Bible, and it might take you a little while to find it because we don't always open to Zephaniah, it's actually the fourth book. If you go to Matthew and then go backwards, it's the fourth book of the Old Testament from the book of Matthew. All right? I think Cole's, Cole's going to read. Uh, that, so as you guys are turning there and we hear the pages turning, as soon as he hears those pages stop turning, might be a little bit, that's okay. I gave a couple of you guys like a week heads up, so hopefully you found it by now, right? Um, Cole's going to read. We're going to be in chapter 3, and he's going to read verses 9 through 20. Chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. And as we always do, will you guys please stand for the reading of God's Word? Did you find it or Carly find it? There you go. For that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid." Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of the Lord. Thank you for Zephaniah. Lord, this might be a book that some of us in here have never even opened or looked at, but it declares some of your greatest love and passion for your people. Lord, it says that one day, the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, that you will sing loudly over your children. That is an incredible thought. The Lord, the one who spoke this creation into existence, will be singing over you and me. Lord, we look forward to that day because as we look around the world, we see nothing but discord, disunity, and war. And Lord, we, we, we pray for this day to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. We're actually going to cover the whole book of Zephaniah this morning, but to kick us off, I have a couple pictures of um, uh, an event that happened, the High Park Fire. How many of you guys remember that, the High Park Fire? That was in 2012, the High Park Fire. That was six years ago, and I think we have some pictures here, Tyler Dell, and this is out of my house, so I know it might be tough to see, but... I just walked out my driveway, and, and we live up near a horse tooth there, and you can kind of see that you can't see the sky. Actually, if, there was, you know, the, if I took a better photo, you'd see actually there's some red, there's some orange from the fire. And we know, as I look to the left, I know that there was nothing but destruction happening. I mean, this fire was burning everything in its path. We had a couple people that lost homes in this fire. They lost a lot of things. I mean, it just devastated the mountains, the homes, and some families. And then as I looked, so I was looking to the right out of my driveway. Then I looked to the left out of my driveway, and this is what I saw. 
How about that? The right, you see smoke, fire, destruction. To the left, you see beauty, clouds, a peace. I mean, you could almost use this as a, a picture for the, the city of Fort Collins, right? Serenity. It looks awesome. Well, today in the book of Zephaniah, we're going to get a glimpse into what's called the day of the Lord. This is the second coming of Christ. And on this day, this day that Zephaniah is talking about, that's near, that's approaching, there will be two very different judgments that happen at the same time, just like that picture. We'll, we'll, when the day of the Lord comes, we'll look to our right and we'll see the Lord as the holy judge exercising his justice on those who don't repent and trust in Christ, and we'll look to our right and we will see heaven, glory, our mansion if we trust and repent in Him. We will see experience global righteous judgment or global righteous blessing. Everyone who's ever existed on the earth on that day, the day of the Lord. As I said, we're going to cover the whole book of Zephaniah, three chapters, um, but we're going to cover chapters 1 through 1 through 3, 9, very quickly. So let me just give you the context of what's taking place. And, and here we see the one side of the day of the Lord. That's going to be the justice of the day of the Lord. It's where the, the, the Lord judges sin and, and death and, and Satan and all those who uh, comply with that. Zephaniah 1, 1 says this. It gives us the historical setting. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gildaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the day of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. So that's the historical setting. Now, Zephaniah is, is, is called by many the, the royal prophet, uh, because out of all the prophets, he actually had a pretty good gig. He was, he was prophesying in a time where restoration was coming back to, to Judah. He, he served under a couple good kings. Uh, one, his great-great-grandfather was the good king Hezekiah. And here, he's serving under King Josiah, who was one of the few good kings in Israel's history. This takes place about 640 or 609 B.C., and again, the, the kingdom that um, Zephaniah is, is walking along with Josiah, and, and the, the kingdom that Josiah inherited when he was eight years old, he reigned for 31 years, King Josiah. It was marked by sin. It was marked by rebellion. It was marked by idolatry and immorality and wickedness. And this little eight-year-old king, full of the Spirit of God, convicted by the, the Spirit of God, led the people back to God with Zephaniah's help. Josiah brought reform back to the people of Judah. He destroyed the idols and brought them back to the one true God. He cleaned up the immorality and the rebellion and restored worship uh, to the one true God in the temple. And Zephaniah was the prophet uh, that was helping Josiah along these lines. And, and here the Zephaniah gets a word from the Lord. And, and it's, it's, it's in the scripture for us to, to kind of give us a glimpse back of how Zephaniah brought and was used by the Lord to bring the nation of Judah back to God through repentance and humility. Uh, the main message of Zephaniah is the day of the Lord. It's actually, uh, Zephaniah calls uh, the nation of Judah to repent of their sin. The way he does that, he says, look forward to the day of the Lord. I want you to look forward to when the Lord comes back, things are going to happen. And if you're not ready for him, you're going to be judged. So therefore, repent. This is the message of Zephaniah. It's about the day of the Lord. He uses this expression more than any other prophet in the Old Testament. So what is the day of the Lord? It, it revolves around Christ's second coming. We just celebrated Christmas and His first coming a, a couple months ago in December, obviously. We, we just celebrated uh, His life, death, and resurrection uh, where Christ now goes, ascends to the Father. And now we're in this period, this time of waiting for the second coming of Christ. Well, the day of the Lord is this, the final judgment in which the Lord will directly intervene, intervenes with human history. He intervenes with human affairs. He comes back and he will judge and cast Satan and all those who reject him into the lake of fire and will raise up to glory and blessing those who repented and believed in Christ and his life, his death, his resurrection to the new heaven and new earth. This is what's going to happen on this day, the day of the Lord that is coming. We, we see in chapter 1 that uh, the judgment and the call to repentance is mainly to Judah and to Jerusalem. And then in chapter 2, it's to the surrounding cities around Jerusalem. We see this. We see in verse 5, it says Canaan, the Philistines. That would be modern-day Gaza. 
and that's west of Jerusalem. We see in verse 9, we see judgment comes on Moab. Moab is directly east of Jerusalem. It's, it's this, this Jordan, the country Jordan today. In verse 12, we see that this, the, the nation of Cush, that's an African country, mainly probably Ethiopia around there. So that's the south. And then we see in verse 13, we see Assyria or the north. That would be a, a modern day Syria or Turkey. So that puts in context the context the, the judgments that's surrounding the nations in chapter two. Uh, they're still there today. And then we see in, in chapter three, we usually see judgment in, in verses one through eight on the whole world. But I just want you to read, I want to read through this very, very quickly because I, I want you to feel the, the force, the impact, the severity of the judgment that is coming to those who are not in Christ. Zephaniah 1 2 just, I mean, just gives it to us. He says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. That's comprehensive judgment. I will sweep everything away. Look at 115. Says the day of the Lord is a day of wrath, of distress and anguish, of devastation and ruin and darkness and gloom and clouds and thick darkness, and it will be a day of battle cries. And we see that verse 17 in chapter 1, it tells us why the judgment. Because they have sinned against the Lord. They have sinned against the Lord. You see, this judgment that we just read about, this destruction, this totality of severity of the Lord wiping all evil off the earth is is good, is right, is just. You see, people that that don't repent and trust in the Lord or in Christ, they rebel against the King. They, they commit treason against the Lord of heaven and earth, and therefore their, their punishment is just and fair. It fits the crime. I, I know we kind of live in a world in the United States of America where you can break laws and maybe you'll get punished or maybe you won't get punished. And in some areas, in some arenas, they, say they encourage you to break the laws and there's no punishment, but the Lord does not operate like that. The laws that he, the, the, the laws that he has written in his book, he will execute. And justice is a part of that. Why? It's because he's holy, and he's just, and he's righteous. Zephaniah says that this day is near. So he's calling, and he's he's proclaiming this to the people of Judah to to repent of their sin because you do not want to be on the justice side and get that declaration over your life. Zephaniah says here, Paul in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, says this, There is a fixed day where he, the Lord, will judge the world in righteousness. There's a day in the Lord's economy in heaven that's coming. It's not yet. We haven't seen it yet. That's coming that he will come back his second coming and execute this judgment. Now, when we read this, we know that that's not a good day for some people, right? That's going to be a very, very bad day for some people. Those people that, again, are outside the sheepfold of the Lord that have rejected the Lord, that have rejected the gospel, that have rejected Him calling them to Himself and saying, hey, I want to be your king, I want to be your God, I want to, I want to be your Savior, and yet they say, I want no part of you. I, I, I want to pause, because this is sober. And if you don't know the Lord this morning, our prayer is that you would, you would see your rebellion against the King, that you would see your sin against the Lord, and you would move your heart, you would attune, you would align your heart through repentance and faith in what Christ has done for you. Uh, The Savior, the Lord loves you so much that He did send you an out. He did send you uh, a Savior to live and to die in your place so that you can know the Lord as your Father and not your judge. So I would plead with you this morning to repent as we go through this, to repent of your sins and rejoice in what Christ has done with you. So this is the, the bad side of the coin of the day of the Lord for some people. But really, it's a, it's a good side because we see in God's economy that He is, he is righteous, He is just, He is holy. What He says He's going to do, He's going to do. Now let's quickly and spend the rest of our time looking at the other side of the coin, the good news of the day of the wrath. And here we see the Lord's loving kindness, His abundant graciousness towards you and me this morning. And that's where we go to now, uh, Zephaniah 3, starting in verse 9. And we see because of the day of the Lord, we will experience perfect unity 
and humility worldwide. Because we have the day of the Lord, we will experience perfect unity and humility worldwide. In verse 9 of Zephaniah 3, it says this, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord. So here is Zephaniah pleading that anyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We'll experience this unity, this humility that is to come. And what Zephaniah is pointing out is actually something that happened way back in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 11, uh, we had the Tower of Babel. And this is where the Lord intervened in human history in one way and created the different ethnicities and the different languages around. And what we see in Zephaniah 3.9 is we see the reversal of Babel. We see that the Lord God is going to reverse what he did in Genesis chapter 11. And just a quick note, we are probably going to go through Genesis in the fall. Starting in the fall, we're going to start at Genesis 1-1 and, and teach through the book of Genesis. So that's pretty cool. So we'll really get into Genesis 11. But this is what you need to know about the, the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. That humanity, humankind, men and women, that in their pride, they say, we want to be like God. And so we're going to, bring, we're going to come together and we're going to build this massive tower up to God. To show God that, you know, we can, we can get it done without him. And so because of their pride, we see this in Genesis 11, 4, it says this, Then they, the people, said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. So we see that pride is driving them to build this tower. In verse 1, we see in Genesis 11 that, that at that time, the whole world had one common language, and they all spoke the same language, and so they could understand one another. But because of their rebellion and their pride and wanting to be like God, apart from God, God, in His judgment, confuses their languages and scatters the people all over. They, he, he brought in several different languages. So they couldn't understand one another and complete the project. This was their judgment. And when we read in Zephaniah chapter 3, it's on that day, on the day of the Lord, we see the Lord come back and he reverses Babel. We see that diverse speech and all those different languages become one language. We see the division of the nations, nations all of a sudden become one unified nation worldwide. We see them now, instead of going and worshiping all these distinct and other gods that they've created in their minds, that they come back confessing and worshiping the one Lord. Look at Zephaniah 3, 9 again. For at this time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord. This is good news. In fact, what we're about to read is the gospel in the Old Testament. The gospel in the Old Testament. For in that last time, I will change the speech of all the peoples to a pure speech. How can a person's speech change? What physical effect or what spiritual effect must take place in a person for their language to change according to Scripture? We know that their heart must be changed, right? We know in Luke chapter 6, it says this, out of the abundance of the heart, the what? The mouth speaks. So what we see here in Zephaniah is he's talking about a, a change of heart. The reason why the people of this day, the day of the Lord, are going to be speaking one in unity with one another in a pure speech is because their hearts have been changed. They've been regenerated. Because your heart has changed, your speech changes. And what does it change to? We see this in verse 9b. It changes to repentance and faith. Look at 9b. So that they may call upon the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord. That phrase, to call upon the name of the Lord, if you chase that down through all the Bible, it has this this, this meaning to it. It's that the, when the people first prayed in Genesis, that they recognized their need. They recognized that they couldn't get along without the Lord. They, they, they saw their pride, so they repented, and they called on the name of the Lord to keep and to come through with His covenant promises that He had made to save them. So that's where we see repentance and faith. They see their desperate need for the Lord to keep His covenant and save them. Therefore, they repent and they call on His name. This is the gospel in the Old Testament. We see the regeneration of the heart. We see faith and repentance. This is what's going to happen on the day of the Lord worldwide. We're going to have this global uh, kingdom people come together. And what are we going to experience? What are those people that repented when they heard Zephaniah preach back then? What are they going to experience? The same thing that we're going to experience. And let me just point out two things we're going to experience on the day of the Lord. First, we're going to experience perfect unity worldwide. This is kind of under 1A. We will serve Him with one accord. That's unity, one accord. It literally means shoulder to shoulder. 
We will, we will serve him shoulder to shoulder. Immediately my mind goes to, you know, warm Roman warfare and the soldiers that come alongside, and they're all standing in one line with their shields, shoulder to shoulder, just taking over the world. Well, that's what we're going to be doing, taking over the world in unity, shoulder to shoulder. We get a little taste of this in Acts chapter 2. We get a little taste of this in Acts chapter 2 of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit comes upon the people, right? And you have all these nations together in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes, and they're talking all these different languages, and yet what happens? They can all understand one another. There's unity there. How is it that we all hear and understand one another in our own native tongue, the Scripture says? Because the Spirit has given us a little taste of the day of the Lord. He's given us a little taste. We're getting a little taste of that this morning. Actually, we're getting a little taste of the day of the Lord where all the nations will come together under one language and we'll be worshiping the Lord. There'll be unity here because of the gospel. We here at the crossing have, I think, almost every continent represented in in our ethnicities, right? Um, All of us, as we look throughout here, we have people from Europe and Asia and Africa, um, obviously the United States, South America. I don't know if we have anyone from Antarctica here, right? I don't know. Um, And maybe Australia, maybe Australia, I don't know. But we're all here getting a little taste of what the day of the Lord. The only thing that can bring every single person in here is we are under the unity of the Lord and his message and his gospel. And then finally, we'll experience this unity on that day, perfectly, the salvation of the world. Notice in verse 10, it says, from beyond the rivers of Cush, again, beyond the rivers of Africa will be my worshipers. That's just, that's talking about Gentiles there. Not only salvation for the Jews, but it's also for the Gentiles. And in Revelation 7, 9, it says this, that great scene that will happen. Great multitudes from every tribe, every tongue, every nation proclaim with unity salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What a day that is going to be. What a day is that going to be? I mean, think about it. We just launched, I don't know how many missiles against Syria, right? We did that uh, about a year ago this time. We've been in this war for 20 plus years, I think. You know, that, that I mean, it, it's a massive war. How, how great is it one day to turn on your TV and be Perfect peace. No wars going on. This is crazy. I did a little research on this. There's almost 195 countries in the world, 195 countries, give or take, right? Do you know how many of them are not at war at, of some kind right now? Can you get, take a guess? 11. 11 according to a news article, and that was in 2014. So that means there's 184 countries at war with one another right now, that there's no peace, that there's no unity. So if you want to take a step back and say, hey, what describes the world? Disunity. War. Can you imagine that one day, the day of the Lord, when it comes back and there's no war, there's no injustice, there'll be no fear, there'll be no one hiding in bunkers because missiles are being launched at them. There'll be no death. There will be no stench of death in some of these cities. There'll be perfect unity around the world. And the reason why perfect unity around the world is because it will be the day of the Lord. 1B. Secondly, we see the day of the Lord brings perfect humility worldwide. On that day, verse 11, it says, On that day you shall not be put to shame because of your deeds done by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty on my holy mountain. Verse 12, But I will leave in your midst the people humble and lowly, and they shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord and no longer be prideful or haughty. I don't know about you, but I'm longing for that day when you don't have to deal with any arrogant, prideful people, right? Who's going to be happy when that day comes? I know I am, right? Now, I know I'm, I can be this prideful, haughty, arrogant guy. And the Lord has to do some work on me. And this is what Zephaniah 2.2 says. He pleads with the people to seek the Lord, to humble your hearts and repent and trust the Lord. And what will happen? The Lord will forgive. You see, C.J. Mahaney pointed this out in his book, Humility. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, it says this. Now the Lord's eyes go to and fro all over the world looking for himself to give strong support to those that are blameless. And then Isaiah, he points out, says this, this is the one who I will look to, the Lord says. This is the one that I'm going to look to that has these characteristics in their lives. 
The first thing, the one who is humble. The one who is contrite or has compassion and the one who fears my word. This is the one, this is the person, male or female, that the Lord is going to bring and give his support to, the one who is humble. Peter and James both put their stamp of approval on this when they say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. See, what Zephaniah is saying, what he's, what he's calling us to this morning is he's calling us to, to humble ourselves under the hand of a gracious and loving God because you don't want the Lord to humble you. See, humble yourself now so you will not be humiliated later. That's what Zephaniah is calling us to. He's calling us to be humble. Repentance always involves humility. It's, 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 it's understanding first and foremost that as people, we rebel against the Lord. And we need to humble ourselves to say, hey, I can't do it on my own. That I need a Savior. I need to repent of my sins. I see my faults, and I turn to what He has provided for us in Christ. That's what humility does to us vertically with the Lord. It causes us to get on our knees and say, you are God, I am not. And then the second thing, not just for salvation, but also for all of life. All of life, humility should dictate our hearts because everything that you and I have in this life is a gift from God. Is a gift from God. Right? We've been talking about this for over the last year, that every good thing that we have in our life is a gift from God. If you have a good marriage, that's a gift from God. If you have a great job and you're smart and you're intellectual, that's a gift from God. If you're a great leader, that's a gift from God. If you're a great athlete, that's a gift from God. If you're healthy, that's a gift from God. And you're like, well, wait a second. I work hard for some of that stuff, right? I mean, I I, I wake up at so-and-so. I get my nose to the grind. I grind. Yes, that's good. God has given you that ability to do that, but he's done that so that you can praise his name. Because I can point out a lot of money, uh, more people in your life that are working harder than you, that are working smarter than you, but don't have what you have. Right? That's God being gracious to us and giving us good gifts. And that's when we recognize and we humble ourselves like, Lord, yeah, thank you for all the good things that I've had. I recognize I have a part to play and I'm, I'm, I need to strive and work hard and go after it. But I also recognize that it's from your good hand that I have all these good gifts. And that keeps us in a state of humility. We recognize that God is leading, directing, and blessing us. And he's given us that ability. That will keep us humble. I love how C.S. Lewis said this about humility. He said this, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Isn't that good? I think that sums it up. And on that day, there will be no more arrogance or pride. There will be perfect humility around the world. What an incredible day that is. So secondly, Zephaniah 3, 14 through 17 says this, because of the day of the Lord, we will rejoice through song, everyone. This is just awesome, these next couple verses. Verse 14, sing aloud, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with your heart, O daughters of Jerusalem. Got a question for you. What is the best concert you ever went to? Think about that. How many of you guys have gone to a concert in here before? right? All right. The best concert that I ever went to was Ready for the World in like 1986, all right? Ready for the World in my day, for you guys who don't know, it was kind of like earth, wind, and fire back in that day. This soulful group of these guys, there are about six to seven of them. They all played an instrument, and it was just awesome. It was just, it just, the music moved your soul. I was like, on, I was like this is awesome. Now, for some of you, it might have been like a Billy Joel concert, right? Or maybe even a Billy Idol concert, right? I don't know. Who's a Billy in country music? I don't know any country music. Billy who? Billy, huh? Exactly. That guy, right? You know? Now, and some of you might say, hey, this is like Van Halen. Yeah. Ozzy Osbourne? Ah, maybe not so much on that one, right? No, but... The point is, it, it might have been for you. Why? Because God is, that's just God's generous gift to all people. He's given us abilities. And, and one of the gifts he's given to mankind has been music and to make music, whether it's secular or sacred. It's, it's all a gift from God. Well, whatever that best concert was for you, this day is going to be like a concert unlike any of that. Times a gazillion, times infinity. And guess what? You're going to be a part of it. You're actually going to have a part to play in it. It says, you will sing aloud, you will shout, you will rejoice. 
That is an incredible thing. We will be singing and rejoicing and exulting with all of our hearts. Now it says, daughters of Zion, Israel, and Jerusalem, you're like, I'm not Jewish. How does this pertain to me? Well, in salvation in God's economy um, is not through an ethnicity, but it's, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. So if you repent and trust in Christ, you will be in this concert on that day. Galatians says this, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons and daughters of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized in Christ Jesus and have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Abraham was known as the father of the Jewish people. And he says, hey, if you and I as Gentiles believe in Christ and what he has done for us, we are, we are of our father Abraham, heirs according to the promise. So we will be there on this day singing and rejoicing, and shouting in worship to the Lord with every person from every tribe and every tongue who's repented and trusted in Christ on this day. This is going to be an incredible concert. You'll have your phones, and we'll be waving them, right? For us, we might have some lighters in heaven waving them, all right? But why are we singing with such gladness? Why, why are we rejoicing with such joy? Well, he tells us in verse 15, The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst, and you shall never fear evil again. Are you kidding me? Think about that. That's why we're singing. That's why we're rejoicing. It doesn't matter if you sound like a dead seal when you sing, like me. That's why I sit in the front row. You know, I'm going to be singing unashamedly, so other words, for everyone to hear, why? Because God has taken away my judgment. And he's taken away your judgment. And that's why you will be singing and shouting and rejoicing. What a day. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you and me. You know what this is? This is justification in the Old Testament. This is God declaring you and me to be righteous to be holy, to be not guilty. We we know that theologically now. And we even experience some of that freedom now, but we will experience in its fullness on that day personally. And that's going to cause an incredible amount of joy and gladness and praise. On that day, for for, for illustration's sake, it might look something like this. One pastor kind of put it this way, on that day I'll go, you'll go, you'll stand before King Jesus and he'll snap his fingers, clap his hands, he'll do something and all of a sudden Aaron Santini's folder will appear before him. My whole life will appear before him. Your whole life will appear before him. I'll be standing there, he'll be standing here, we'll be looking at each other in our eyes and he's going to say, Aaron Santini, holy blameless, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your master. Not because of anything that I have done, but because of what Christ has done. Isn't that an amazing thought? This is what he's saying. This is why the people are rejoicing, because the Lord of heaven and earth will be looking at you on that day and saying, not guilty, forgiven, in fact, here are the keys to your new mansion, Aaron. Your, your, your mansion in heaven is going to be on David's Mighty Man Drive, just so you know, right? Some of you might be Grace Lane, Forgiveness Street, but you will have a mansion in heaven. The Lord of heaven and earth will come say, I've taken away your judgments through my son. Well done, good and faithful servant. Here's the great thing. We hear in that now, and that's the future. We'll experience in its fullness, but we can experience that now. We can experience justification now. We have it now. Why? Because our judgment day has already passed in Christ. Already, not yet. Positionally, we are already declared justified. He has already taken away our sin, my sin, your sin, and he's given us his righteousness. And that day, the day that will come, the not yet, is coming. And on that day, that's when we'll experience full justification, but we can experience that now. 
And that could cause us to rejoice now. That's the reason why Sunday mornings are so important. That we come here and we have gifted musicians like Cole and the rest that lead us in the worship to God. Because it's a foretaste of what we're going to experience on that day of the Lord. Our singing, our rejoicing. So when you understand this truth that you are forgiven, the judgment has been taken away. You will have it no longer. That is your position right now. When you come on Sunday, you can't sing like, oh, praise the Lord, you know. It's like shout. Some of you like raise your hands. You're right here. You know, I'm right here. That's okay. I mean, but let it go. Don't be fearful. Know what your position is and worship. However God has wired you, you don't have to raise your hands. You don't have to clap. But sing loudly because you have, your judgment has been taken away. Isn't that great news? And that's why every Sunday we need to come here and be led in song because we are singing the gospel in this very truth. We scream and shout at weddings and at babies being born, at graduation, and at Super Bowl wins and Stanley Cup wins, and rightly so. We should. That brings us joy. We should rejoice. We should stand up and clap. We should shout. But nothing will compare to the absolute rush of joy and happiness that we'll experience on that day, knowing the judgment against you and me has been paid in full. Amen? And not only that, our justification fully realized, but also we rejoice because we will finally be with Jesus personally, physically. We will see Him. He will see us. We can touch Him just like Thomas did. We can walk with Him. We can talk with Him. Because I don't know about you, I I can't wait for that day because sometimes it's hard following Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus when I can't see him. Anyone else with me? I mean, that's me. It's hard sometimes. Is this really, really true? You know, sometimes that doubt creeps in. Not on that day. On that day, we'll be playing ball with Jesus, or at least I will. Some of you guys will be reading with Jesus, drinking coffee with Jesus, whatever. But that's going to be a great day. Jesus the King will be in our midst for eternity. But there's something that's even more amazing than that. This is truly stunning. We see that in verse 17. Verse 17 of chapter 3. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you. Let me just say that again. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet your soul. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. That is almost unbelievable, but it's true. On that day, the king of creation will be singing over you loudly for the whole world to sing. His joy, his love, his singing will be displayed. And what is the cause of his gladness? What is the cause of his love? What is the cause of his singing? It's you. It's me because we're in Christ. Because we're in Christ, God the Father will delight over us with singing. Again, there's one qualifier in here. I want to be open and honest with you, and I've already shared it. You have to be in Christ. You have to be a child of the King. You have to repent of your sins and trust in Christ's life, death, and resurrection for you. So if you haven't done that, today is the day. There's no magical potion. You don't have to write anything out. You just have to see yourself as a sinner, one who's rebelled against God, and receive what Christ has done for you. Confess your sin and believe in what Christ, and then this day is for you. The loud singing of the Lord rejoicing over you. But, but Aaron, you don't know what I've done. Doesn't matter. He does, and he still offers this to you. But Aaron, I can't. It's, it's true. You see, the Lord on that day is not going to say to you, considering what I had to begin with. I guess you came out okay, right? The NFL draft is coming up in a couple weeks, and all these guys, you know are going to be drafted to be saviors of their team. And a lot of them are going to be cut after two years. They're going to be cut. Worthless. Not worthy of the pick. Can't help us. You're done. Listen, there are no cuts. There are no busts in Christ. If you are in Christ, the Lord sees you as a child of the King, and He's going to rejoice over you. We have that great picture of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, right? Or the prodigal son wishes his father dead. Give me my money. Give me my inheritance. He runs off. He, he, he spends all of it on, on prostitutes and partying, etc. And he comes back. And the father does what? 
The father is looking for his son to come back. And when he sees him, he runs after him. Men, old men, patriarchs back then, don't run. You run to the father. The father runs to his son, kisses him, hugs him, puts feet, uh, you know, shoes on his feet, gives him his rings, brings him in and throws a party. My son is home. Let's party. That is what's going to take place here. Matt Chandler points this out, and it's just one of the biggest, best things I've ever heard in my life, talking about this. He says this, If God spoke and all of creation came into being, think about that. God speaks, and we have this glorious creation. We get to experience in Colorado, the beauty, right, the mountains, all, all that. And he still upholds it by his word. Get this. What will be produced in your soul? What will be produced in my soul when the Lord is singing over us? Isn't that awesome? He speaks and we get creation. What happens when the Lord sings over us? What does that create? Well, it's going to create something that the world has never seen, literally. And yet we are going to be able to experience that forever. That's awesome. This is what's happening on the day of the Lord. And then quickly, what might happen, it, it leads us to point three. Because of the day of the Lord, we will be regathered of the, be the regathering of the renowned. Verse 18 says this, I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts and I will change their shame into praise and their renown in all the earth. And at that time I will bring you in and at that time I will gather you together for I will make you renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth and I will restore your fortune before your eyes, says the Lord. I don't know what it's going to be like when the Lord sings over us. It's going to be awesome, but it might look something like this. And verses 18, 19 kind of gives us the summary of what might take place. One, suffering will be gone. All kinds of suffering. Physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, all will be gone. Your oppression will be turned to freedom. If some of you in here have a, um, you know, a, a disorder or, or, or handicapped or a disease, it'll be healed. If you feel like an outcast here on earth, you'll be included. Your shame will be turned into praise and everything will be restored before your eyes. This is the day of the Lord. This is the day that we look forward to. This is the day that you and I will experience fully if we're in Christ. So the question is this morning, are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day? When you see and read all the disunity, the hatred, the sin in the world, social media, TV, workplace, shut off the TV, close your computer, go home, Open up the book of Zephaniah, a book that was written thousands of years ago, and read about the day of the Lord that's coming to you. Let that just be a, a balm to your soul. And then go out and share the good news of Jesus in your circles of influence. Let's pray.